We are thankful that you have joined us in worship today. Here at the River Bible Church, we have a mission, and it is to do three things all the time. First is to exalt God. Scripture tells us that the Lord is great and greatly to be praised, and this greatness is unsearchable. So it is our prayer that we as the body of Christ are exalting God above all things, no matter what life brings at us, and that we bless his name forever and ever. And the second is to equip the saints. Ephesians 4 tells us that it's the saints, it's the believers who are to be equipped for the uh, work of ministry. And as the body, the members are working together properly, the church builds itself up in love. And this is with the, the guidance and help of the Holy Spirit and the equipping of the word of God for every good work in Christ Jesus. And the third is to express the love of Christ. Jesus told his disciples, there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Yet we know that Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. While we were yet sinners, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. And so through this divine love and mercy, by faith in Jesus, we are made alive to God and we are saved from the wrath that is to come. And we who have received this love and know this love are to express it through the proclamation of the gospel and through loving others that are around us in word and deed as Christ has loved us and taught us to love. And all this in hopes that we grow in Christ and further his kingdom. And so as we turn to the Lord today, let us ask him, deal bountiful with your servants, Lord, that we may live and keep your word. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, River family. I hope to find you well today. We want to invite you to worship the Lord with us, for he is worthy of our praise.
Father, we come before you and we ask that you would do what only you can. God, that you would fix our gaze upon the person and work of your glorious son, who is worthy of our greatest awe, adoration, and allegiance. And so we ask that your spirit would move among us, God, that he would prepare our hearts, our minds, Lord, that he would give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear, that we might glorify you in all things. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, River family. Glad that you've joined us this morning to walk through the word together and to worship God through song and through giving. And we pray that in this time that uh, we'll be led by the Lord, that our hearts would be encouraged, and that God would continue his good work of transforming our hearts and minds. It is our prayer that you've been getting along well uh, in these past few weeks or months. And um, just thankful that we have a God that hears our prayers that we can depend on and turn to. I want to remind us uh, of discipleship, that um, we need to continue in those discipleship relationships or pursuing those relationships even in this time. Uh, we don't know uh, what kind of changes will take place, and so uh, we don't need to wait, wait for discipleship to happen after things change. Uh, it's actually important to have those relationships going and growing and being established even during these times. And let's remember that discipleship is knowing and following Christ and helping others do the same for the glory of God. And that discipleship, uh, biblical discipleship, would be characterized as a relationship and a relationship that is prayerful relationship that is prayerful and spirit-led and is bible-based and is uh, focused on helping one another uh, grow in holiness there's this commitment to holiness and so um, it's relational it's prayerful it's spirit-led uh, bible-based and it's committed to one another's holiness now if you're like me uh, in my family, if you have uh, students in the home, uh, like I talked about last week a little bit, uh, this, the, my girls are still in school and studying. One of them finishes up her finals uh, this past week. Um, but as they've been doing their schoolwork and studying, it, it, it made me this past week just think about uh, my time in school. We didn't have anything like the coronavirus and that that was going on, but uh, you know, we were actually in a school building, um, and as a student, I really struggled uh, as a student in junior high, uh, high school. Uh, my attention span was very short. Um, I was easily distracted, and uh, I was not a very good reader, and my comprehension uh, was very minimal. By the time I started at the top and got to the bottom, I had already forgotten what I had read uh, at the top of the page. Um, I was not ADD. I was ADDDDDDD. Um, my attention span was very short, and I could not focus. Now, all those Ds was not reflective of my report card, even though I did have a few Ds uh, on my report card. I managed to make A's, B's, and C's. But, um, but I was just not a very good student. I struggled. Um, and throughout that time, um, I required a lot of help to come my way in the area of schooling. Uh, I had wonderful teachers and also wonderful parents that uh, helped me along the way. And, um, and that was something that just my condition required that. It required people to help me. Uh, I remember numerous times I would get very frustrated at home just because I could not understand. And uh, mom and dad were patient in helping me to understand and teaching me uh, as the teachers also at school. And now the same is true for you and I as followers of Christ. The Lord knows that we need help. He knows that you and I were prone to wonder. He knows that you and I, in living in this temporary uh, world, that you and I are very easily distracted. 
And he knows that you and I in our own capacities are not capable of understanding and knowing who God is. And so in his kindness, in his love, he makes provision for us. He knows that we need him. Listen to what 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 16 says. There toward the end, it says, For who has understood the mind of the Lord? That in itself reveals and exposes mine and your limitations in our need for God to do something. We need help, and this is the love of God. Think about this. God who is holy and righteous, all-knowing, all-powerful, and requires man, if man's going to live in right relationship with him as the holy God, he requires man to be holy, righteous, and blameless. And it's a requirement that you and I, man in his, in, in his own self, he can't accomplish that. Man cannot attain to the requirement that God requires for us to, to be right with him. But this is the love of God. God doesn't change the requirements so that we can be with him. God doesn't lessen the requirement so that we can be with him. But God meets the requirement for man. And he provides for man that which is required for you and I to be in a right relationship with him. That's the love of God. What man can't do in his own power, his own wisdom, in his own strength, and what is required of God, God makes that provision for us. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before God. That's the provision of God through Jesus Christ, that through Jesus Christ you, might, you and I have the righteousness of Christ, that we might be presented in Christ holy and blameless and above reproach before the holy God. That is love. Yet, you and I still live in a world that's fallen. You and I, even as followers of Christ, we sin, we struggle, we wrestle, we, we, we give way to the flesh. Our minds can, 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 can wander. And so how is it that you and I, listen to verse 23 of, of that. I didn't read it. Let me read it. It says, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, before God, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So how is it? How are you and I to continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, and not shifting from the hope of the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, turn with me to John chapter 14. And this will be our main text this morning. John chapter 14, and we'll begin in the, in, with verse 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Jesus is with his disciples here, and he's speaking to them. And I want you to notice there's going to be three times that uh, Jesus says, if you love me, whoever, lo whoever, uh, um, uh, whoever loves me, if anyone loves me. And so three times he says this, and he says the same thing after it. And so again, it, it just reveals that God doesn't lessen that which is required. So let's begin in John 15, 
John 14, beginning in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world, the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Now notice verse 15, verse 21, verse 23, kind of the same thing being said here. If you love me, verse 15, you will keep my commandments. Look at verse 21. Whoever has my commandments keeps them. He it is who loves me. And he who loves me is loved by my Father. Verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Now the question this morning is how? How in the world would you and I be able to keep the commandments of God? How in the world, think about the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. How, how can we do that? How can we love God? The answer, Jesus says, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to send you the helper. Look at that, verse 15 and 16. If you just read through it, it's like is it, there's not a connection there. But if we read through it slowly and think about it, it tells us how. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay? But how in the world are we going to do that? We're prone to wonder. We know in and of ourselves that we don't have the strength to do that, to keep the commandments of God. But Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Now, the disciples had Jesus with them. They followed Jesus. Students, we know what that means. It means that they were in the same way with Jesus. They saw Jesus, they knew who he was, they saw what he did. They saw his power, his authority. They even observed uh, his instruction to others, his instruction even to them. They were often corrected by Jesus. He was keeping them. But Jesus is telling them, I'm going to go be with the Father. But if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. How? How are we going to do that if you're with the Father? And he gives the answer, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. This is the teacher that we need as followers of Christ. God supplies the teacher. He supplies the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter. It says that, that, that Jesus will ask the Father and the Holy Spirit is given by the Father. And the Spirit of God is the loving provision of God to us. Look at verse 17, what Jesus says about 
the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. The end of that verse, it says, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. That he's with us. He's with us forever. The world cannot receive him. It doesn't know him. But those who know Jesus, they will receive the Spirit. You will know him, for he dwells with you. And he will be or is in you. Look at verse 26. 26 helps us see that the Father will send the Holy Spirit. And he says that he'll send him in the name of Jesus. The Spirit of God or even the Spirit of Christ. He will, he will come in the name of Christ. Turn with me to chapter 16 and let's read verses 13 through 15. Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Look at the traveling of that. The Father is given unto the Son, and the Son is given unto the Spirit, and the Spirit declares it to you and I, the people of God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the teacher, the helper, the comforter. How wonderful is that, that God doesn't just leave us and say, okay, uh, I've taught you, I've told you, now just figure it out. And No, but he gives us a helper. There were so many things in school. I just couldn't, it just it didn't make sense. Algebra I had to take twice. The teacher, her name was Killer Miller. She was about this tall. I don't think her first name was Killer, but we called her Killer Miller. And she was short and had a big voice. Mr. Smeltzer. And Miss Miller and my parents met and they talked and I did not do well in algebra. I wasn't catching it. I sat through the whole class. I had to take it twice. I was so hoping that I was going to have a different teacher than Miss Miller. But she said, I want Eric in my class next year. I was like, oh. But she knew me. She knew my struggles. And she was actually loving me. She was tough. But she helped me to grow in understanding algebra two semesters, not one. Folks, I don't know about you, but spiritually, I'm a slow learner. It didn't take long to look back on my life to see, man, I just didn't get a hold of that yet. Humility, being kind, being compassionate, holding my tongue, exercising self-control. If you're like me, it's very clear that you and I need a present teacher, helper. And that's the provision that God sends us in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of Christ. The scripture says in verse 26 of John 14, that he will teach us all things, the perfect teacher, teaching us what is right, the difference between right and wrong, teaching us, uh, giving us understanding of God when we open the word. I've, there's been moments that I will open the word and I have no idea what I've just read. What does this mean? Asking the spirit of truth to give me understanding to the word of God that's the role of the spirit teaching us who God is and what God is doing and the truth and helping us discern between what's right and what's wrong what's true and what's false that's all the work of the helper the Holy Spirit now again when the disciples were with Jesus Jesus was telling them that these things he would speak in a parable then he'd call the disciples close and then he would say here's what that means so, who does that now for you and I? It's the Holy Spirit, the helper. 
Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. And let me read for us verses 9 through 16. But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why? That we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God. For they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Now watch this. But we, we have the mind of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. The Spirit of Christ. Now, closing this morning, let's turn to the book that we've been walking through for a while. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. With all that we've just read and learned about the Holy Spirit, Paul tells the church of Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 beginning in verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. If you are in Christ, you have the mind of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit in you the helper from God in the name of Jesus in you to help you, to comfort you. If we read, I believe it's in Hebrews, interceding for us and praying, uh, uttering uh, groans whenever we don't even know how to pray, helping you and I in our weakness. He's teaching us and he's reminding us of the things of God. Dear folks, do not quench the Spirit. We read throughout the Scripture that says to walk in the Spirit or to keep in step with the Spirit. How do we do that? How how, how do we keep in step with the Spirit? If we're careful, if we're not careful, we can easily make that think that that's up to us, that that's by our own power, that that's by our own might, that we would even keep in step with the Spirit, that that's by our own wisdom, but it's not, because we couldn't do that on our own. To even keep in step with the Spirit, we must even depend on the Spirit, and we do that through prayer. We pray and ask the Spirit of God to do in and through us that which we cannot do, but how often do we rely on On the Spirit of God. How often do we lean into the Spirit of God through prayer? Temptation enters our mind and we just run with it. When we should stop and pray and say, God, I know that what's in my mind does not glorify you. Would you remove it from from, from my mind? Would you quit letting me think about this? Would you do something for me that I can't do? Don't quench the Spirit. Lean into the Spirit of God. There's probably numerous opportunities in the days in which we live in today. Frustration, fear, anger. 
I'm ready to go with, 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 with all of you. I'm ready to be together. But everything doesn't happen on what I'm ready to do. So there can be a lot of frustration. God, would you hold the words before they come out of my mouth? Let me have self-control. Let me not speak that which I am thinking, dear God. Would you do in me that which I cannot do? We must lean in to our helper and pray. That's how we keep in step with the Spirit. We pray and we depend on the Spirit of God. The other day I was working, I was building a flower box in the backyard, a garden box. And uh, I was working real fast and I pulled my drill out and I was going over here and I was uh, going to need to drill something over here, but I wanted to cut a board before I did all that. And, you know, just moving quickly and I got to my drill and the bit was gone. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay. Where did I have it last? I don't even remember. And there's this little black bit about this big that could be anywhere all over my yard. And I had, didn't have another. It was my only bit. And I knew, I was just like, I don't have a chance at this. So I just stopped and prayed. I immediately went, God, the only way that I'm going to find this bit is if you just show it to me. There's not, there's not a chance. It's like a needle in a haystack. And so, God, I'm asking by your grace, would you put my eyes on the bit? I moved from the grass and I moved to some leaves and I raked the leaves, one rake, and right there in front of my eyes was the drill bit. It was 15 feet away from the drill. And this scenario happened not once, but it happened twice. So 10 minutes later, the same exercise <laughs> happened. <laughs> the drill bit came out. I lost it. I would have been foolish to think that, okay, I can think about this and just find it. No. But I was so pleased and glorified God just in this very simple thing. It would be silly to most of us, but lean into the Spirit of God. He wants to show you His power and His might. Depend on Him. Trust Him. Pray. Ask the Spirit. He's here to help you, to teach you, to comfort you, to remind you, to lead you. And dear people, ask the Spirit to give you discernment. So that you can know, my goodness, we live in a day, there's so much information out there. Jesus' name tagged to a number of things that are not even of him or from him. We need discernment. Look at what it says there in the scripture. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Well, how are you going to know what to, what's true and what's not true? You're going to know that by the spirit of God. And it's always going to be according to the word of God. He's the spirit of truth. Look what it says. But test everything. What do you test it against? You test it against the word of God. And ask the spirit to give you discernment. Why? Because look at the next instruction. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. God, you have shown me your truth. And by the power of your spirit, would you help me hold fast to that which is good? And God, would you help me by your power and your might to abstain, to say no, to turn and run from that which is evil? Because God, I can't do it. But God, would you do that by the power of your spirit? Folks, we need to trust and lean in to the spirit of God. Now, I am very thankful for you, River family. I'm thankful for my family, my wife, and my girls, my mom and dad, and my brothers. I'm thankful for brothers and sisters in Christ who have uh, encouraged me in my walk with Christ and who have helped me grow, who have encouraged me in difficult times. I am extremely thankful for, 
for many, many people. But I want to share this. There is no one that can compare to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been into some difficult situations physically. I'm still scratching my head that I'm yet 50. I'm yet 49, and I've had two heart attacks. I, it, it, I think about that a lot. But it's been in those moments that the Holy Spirit has been present and powerful and comforting. He has spoken to me the words of God and the truth of God and the promises of God in ways that no human lips can ever speak. The presence of the Holy Spirit, it way outweighs the presence of anyone else. And folks, let's not quench the Holy Spirit. I want to close with this. Growing up as a child, we sat through many, many sermons, went to many, many Sunday school classes, went to many, many teachings of God's Word, and uh, been instructed in uh, numerous settings, Natchez, Mississippi, Tallahassee, Florida. Seems like we were always in church, and I, I don't, that's not a negative thing for me, it's just a fact. Uh, we were always in church. And listening, I always had so many questions that ran through my, my little mind. Now, here's one of them. Why didn't Jesus just come down off of the cross and just whip the bad guys? You know, he's all powerful. Uh, he can do it. All he had to do was just say a word. Why didn't he just do that? That was a question that was running through my little uh, uneducated mind at times. Another one was, why in the world would the followers of Jesus be hated by the world? Why did Jesus say that those who followed him would be so mistreated by the world? I couldn't comprehend that. I didn't understand that. Another one that I thought about a lot, usually just while I was fishing, uh, why is life hard at times and why do Christians suffer? Yeah. That, that's something that ran through my mind. But here's the one that stuck with me for a long time. You know, people, teachers teaching on Revelation and uh, the end times, the, the coming of Christ and all the antichrists that would come and, and, uh, and that would mislead and misguide. Uh, the question that I had was, how will I know? If there's going to be all these, if there's going to be the Antichrist and the false teacher, how am I going to know? If he's, the scripture says, he's going to have power and he's going to do things that are beyond the human power, how will I know that that's the Antichrist and this is the Christ? And I, I wrestled with that so much. I, 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 probably like most of you, I want to know. I don't want to be duped. I don't want to follow the Antichrist. But when he comes in power and does things that he's going to do, how am I going to know that that's not the Christ? Scripture says many false prophets gone out into the world. Scripture says children... It is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Let's close in looking at 1 John chapter 2. I'll read verses 20 through 25. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. 
Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. How will we know? Verse 20. If you read 19, it says, uh, They went out from us, but they were not of us, for they had not been of us. They would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain that they are not of us. But you've been, you've been anointed by the Holy One, and you have knowledge. Where does that knowledge come from? Folks, it comes from the Spirit of Truth. It comes from the Holy Spirit. For the Helper, the Teacher, the Comforter, He opens up the eyes of the blind, and He gives us understanding and knowledge. That's how we will know. And let's turn real quickly to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 through 24. Listen to the promise. Listen to the security. Listen to the work of God. Now may the God of peace, it's, it's presented to us in, uh, like a prayer. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. Listen, he will surely do it. Folks, that's the love of God that he has provided everything that we need for life and for godliness. He has given us his helper. He has placed his spirit within us to accomplish in us that which we couldn't do on our own. And it's all for the glory of God. I want to ask us, us a few questions as we, um, right before we pray and as we're in these unique times. These times are telling, okay? And I want to give us a word of encouragement. When you put a grape in the wine press and you start pressing the grapes, out of the tap comes grape juice. These times are like being in the wine press. The pressure is being put on. The squeezing is happening. And so let's take note not for everybody else out there, but for yourself. What's coming out of the tap in this time of pressure? Okay, there's many opportunities to be frustrated, angry, and confused, and um, lose self-control. You know, there's a lot of things right now that seem to be out of our control. But the reality is, we're never really in control. And the situations we're facing right now are revealing that to us. We can't make this thing go away. There's lots of things we can't control. But what's controlling you right now? Is it your flesh? Or is it the Spirit of God? As the pressure's being put on, is it the fruit of the Spirit that's coming out of the tap? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. That's what ought to be coming out of the tap of the lives of Christians as we're pushed on. And if we're finding something different, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so thankful that you have provided for us everything that is needed to be acceptable to you, the holy and righteous God. Lord, you have sent your Son who has lived, who has persecuted, who 
died on the cross who made the payment for the penalty of our sin, who conquered death and who rose again, and who spoke to many, and who has told us that he is going to go be with you and prepare a place for us. And Father, in that he has asked of you that you would send a helper. And Father, you have, you have sent your spirit the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, our teacher, our comforter, the Spirit of Christ, to be in us, to do that which we can't do on our own. Father, let us be wise and depend on your Spirit. Father, we thank you, and we pray that it is the fruit of your spirit that is exposed in these days that many of us may feel so much pressure. God, thank you that we can lean into you, that we can trust you, and that you are our ever-present help in our time of need. God, we thank you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Rock my
read for us out of 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. It says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his, his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. As children of God, this we believe.
God is so good, and we just want you to know that we are praying for you during this time. And if you have any needs, um, if you have anything, any ways that you need to be ministered to, please let us know. Um, please contact us and let us know how we can minister or serve you during this time. Um, please stay also in, in contact with us through Facebook, Instagram, and the emails. This is, this is the way that we are going to inform you. Uh, of how we're going to be moving forward and so uh, so we want you to know and, and to be connected in that way and also just continue to remember that uh, worship through giving uh, there are ways that you can give and and in your giving that's going to help us to support our ministries in uh, in Canada and Haiti Mountain Home and in Summit and uh, you can mail in a check to P.O. Box 24 13, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654. And, uh, or you can give online at our website, theriverMH.org. Uh, River's Edge is going to be meeting tonight on Zoom, and so uh, for, for those uh, students, we'll see you on Zoom tonight. And I just wanted to remind us, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. I just want to remember that the God of peace himself is doing this work even during this time. He's with you. 
and he is doing his work, and it is going to be complete, and he's going to do it perfectly, and he is going to sanctify us until uh, we reach that time that we see him face to face. And God's promise to us is that he will surely do it. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your faithfulness. I thank you for your goodness and that you are accomplishing something even right now, Lord, during this virus. Whether we, we see it one way or we see it another, there's people on, on all different sides, Lord. There's confusion, there's doubts, there's, uh, there, there are fears, there's frustration. God, but we know one thing, that you are in total control and you are even using this to, to shape us and to mold us and to sanctify us into your image. God, so let us not waste this opportunity, but let us be thankful. Let us give you thanks wherever we find ourselves. Because, God, you are sanctifying us and you will finish your work and it will be complete at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the peace that you give us. We thank you that you are with us. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you.